Take a seat. Good morning. All right, how many of you have brackets that are completely busted already? Thank you, Oakland and Kentucky. 
Yeah, all right, it's, that's over for me. I guess March Madness will happen again next year. I didn't have them winning, but I did have them going way too deep. So uh, today is a CU Friday, so we have a lot of guests on campus. So if you are a guest here with us, would you stand up and let us welcome you here to campus for CU Friday? And for our students and all, we have a lot going on this weekend. So are you ready for the truckload of announcements that's, that's about to take place? So hilarious hoopla, 6 p.m. in the recital hall featuring Dr. and Mrs. Kevin Sims. And then in here tonight at 7 p.m., our music and worship area will present glorious fusion. And so tickets are needed for that. So come take advantage of the opportunity right here, 7 o'clock in this room. Today at 1 o'clock, you have baseball. It is our home opener. And then tomorrow, I think it's at 12 tomorrow, but you can look at it. Baseball will be there. You know, I, I meant to mention softball when I was up earlier this week because last weekend, softball had two games that were 10th inning walk-off runs to win both of them. So it was incredibly exciting. So can you give it up for softball? Just to, They did a great job. And then tomorrow, Saturday, is Alt 5. So we have food trucks, capture the flag, line dancing, Hunger Games movie in the chapel at 8 p.m., and a cereal bar from 10 p.m. to midnight. Do they have, yeah, they have a slide up there. There you go. So, all right. So you got all sorts of stuff going on around here that you can do. And then I also need to let you know, not that most of you are going to do this, but our men's basketball team will be playing in Winona Lake, Indiana tomorrow for the NCCAA National Championship. And so they are competing. It's the number one seed versus the number two seed. Should be a tough game. I think it's at two o'clock. We got social media stuff out there. If you wanna try to find out how to watch that, if that interests you, or if you wanna go, go, cheer them on. I may go. I haven't decided yet. We'll see. I'm trying to work it out. All right, we're in Romans 12. Romans 12. I did two verses last time because I felt like they were so important. So that means today I'm left with finishing the entire chapter, which means we go three through 21. So are you ready to buckle up and roll? So we're gonna do this in a different way than what we normally do. Like normally, you've got one or two main points, three points, you got a main idea, we just kinda look at that each section differently. So what we're gonna do today is, is I'm gonna give you a main idea, and then I'm gonna give you eight characteristics, eight marks of a mature Christian, and then we're gonna read through the whole text, I'll kind of comment on it as we read through it, so I'm not gonna have you stand. So you can sit there, I'll just comment as like a running homily. And then we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at eight characteristics that I have picked out of this text that's the marks of a mature Christian. Now, here's the deal. I need to say this in, in the preface of this. You cannot achieve all eight of these marks every single day for the rest of your life because you are a fallen, sinful human being still wrestling with the flesh. So don't look at these eight marks and say, if I mess up on this one, then I'm, I'm done. And don't look at these marks as boxes that need to be checked so that you can earn your salvation. That's not the point. The point is that we have been saved and we've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But because we have been saved, now we wanna live a life that is transformed and that honors Christ. And this is what that looks like. So we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about sanctification. So that's where we are actually in our outline of Romans. So if you remember the outline of Romans, we talked about how bad we were in the very beginning, we talked about how fallen we were, we talked about, we used our outline cross, so condemnation and then righteousness and then our outlook for Israel, and now we're in the sanctification portion. We began that turn in one and two of chapter 12 last time. Now we're continuing that march in three through 21. And you'll notice a difference even in the way Paul's writing. A lot of these are just sharp, short hitters. Do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And this is what he's saying to us. This is what a mature Christian looks like. This is what we're supposed to look like as followers of Christ. So this is our aspirational goal. If we do these things right, then we as a community will be an authentic Christian community. If you individually do these things right, then you will be bearing out the marks of a mature Christian, a mature follower of Christ. So when we see these, they're aspirational. So here's a thought. You can do this if you want to. You don't have to. 
I've got the slide that has all eight. I'm gonna show it to you a couple of times. But when it pops up, maybe you pull out your phone and take a picture of it. And then you put that picture somewhere to remind yourself of this. Because these are also marks that will make you a good friend to someone else. And that will make you a person that is desirable for other people to have you as a friend. Now, I can't skip over the fact that we have had outside preachers come in and preach twice on, on David and Jonathan, and then on the marks of a good friendship, what it means to be a good friendship, the importance of good friendship. Like, that seems to be a repeated theme. So it seems to me like the Lord is working on all of us to say to us, we need to be better friends to other people. Well, that's part of our core values. When we love God and love others, we should be better friends to other people. And so I think that's what the Lord's working on us right now. So all that he says in chapter 12 talks about how do I love God well and how do I love others well. So we're gonna go deeper into this today and see what it looks like. You say, I wanna know what it looks like to be a mature Christian. I wanna be discipled. I wanna grow in my faith. We're gonna give you eight marks today that you can just walk through and examine your own life. Don't think about somebody else. Don't hear this and go, boy, I hope so-and-so's here because they really need to hear this. They were mean to me. Think about your own life and say, what is it that I need to work on so that I can follow Christ better? So here's our main idea. This whole thing's kind of clunky, if you want to be honest about it. This is not a polished sermon, but we're going to have fun with it anyway. Our main idea is a transformed life. So we're tying back in verse two. Leads to authentic Christian community corporately and marks of a mature Christian personally. So if you're a guest here and you're wondering what do we want our community to look like, you're gonna see a glimpse of it today. If you're a student here and you wanna know, is this okay at Cedarville? Well, we wanna, we wanna do what's okay and pleasing to Jesus, so you're gonna see what we aspire to and think we should do today. All right, I'm gonna give you the marks before I read the text, just so you can have them and look at them and know where we're headed. Here are the marks of a mature Christian. You're gonna see humility, a mature Christian is going to be humble. A mature Christian is going to be a church member. You're going to be involved in your local church. A mature Christian is seeking to serve, not self-centered, not selfish, and not just serving when asked, but seeking to serve. You have genuine love for others, not a fake love, not, oh, I want to love people so people think I'm loving, but you actually have a genuine love for others, a genuine concern that flows from being saved and knowing about Christ's concern for us. And then we genuinely love others. I can't even figure out the right, right word for this next one. So you'll see why when we get there. But pleasant is what I landed on. And then I thought, ah, eh, pleasant doesn't fully capture it. And I'm not trying to get a grade on this, so who cares? Pleasant, joyful, patient, or steadfast. Take your pick. You'll see it when we get to the verse as to why you could pick any of those. Generous. You say, I can't be generous. I don't have anything to be generous with. I'm a college student. You have time and you have talents that you can be generous with. And if you have a heart of generosity as to how you're gonna give to others and not just accumulate for yourself, you develop that now. You don't develop that later. Peaceable. This is for all the awkward roommate situations, but we'll get there eventually. And you're an overcomer. That's gonna hit verse 21. All right, so I'm gonna roll through the text, kind of just reading it all out, and then we're gonna jump back and we'll walk through all eight of these. All right, let's read the text. Romans chapter 12. I'm gonna start in verse one and two because one and two lays the groundwork for what we're talking about through the rest of it. So I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So we're starting out with the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does it mean to present my body as a living sacrifice? We're gonna roll through the whole list. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. It's your logical service. It's the fact that we have experienced not only mentally, but also emotionally what Christ has done for us. So our only proper response, the only spiritual worship, the only logical service, the only thing we can do in response to this, present our bodies as a living sacrifice. That's what we should do. And that means do not be conformed to this world. Now notice on this list when we start going through these, if you wanna say, what does it mean not to be conformed to the world? Well, be humble. Genuinely love others. Don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. Don't seek an eye for an eye. Be a peaceable person. All of this list are things that the world is not gonna tell you are the great things or the marks of somebody they're gonna exalt. So what does it mean not to be conformed? Here we go, buckle up. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind 
So how do I renew my mind? In the word, no Bible, no breakfast. Get in the word, stay in the word, listen to the word, meditate on the word, memorize the word. By the Spirit's work and the word in your life, you will be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we've talked about the mind. So here we go. For by the grace given to me, Paul says, I say to everyone, you're gonna see think in this, I'm reading out of the ESV. You're gonna see think here three times. If you're reading out of a different translation, it's four in some, just in this verse. And so that hearkens us right back to renewing the mind. And he says to us, I say to everyone, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of the faith that God has given them. He's setting this up to talk about the spiritual gifts. And he's saying to all of us, think about yourself humbly. He's saying to all of us, don't be that person that was on American Idol that thought they could sing in an incredibly great way and everybody watched them sing and realized they had a horrible voice. Don't be that person that is on whatever social media thing you want, that sings the Christmas carol and they sing it in an incredibly off key, but they sing it as though they think they are just God's gift to humanity. And all of us listen to that and laugh at them because they think they're great and we think they're horrible. And the funny part is they don't get it. Now that's a problem of genuinely loving others. We'll get to that later. But he tells us all, be humble in our estimation of ourselves, each according to the measure of faith that God has given us. Some of us have deeper faith. Some of us have less faith. You're going to exercise your spiritual gifts based on the amount of faith you have. How do you have more faith? Learn more about God. Love God more. Here you go. Verse four. For is in one body. Here we go talking about church membership. We'll come back to it. We have many members and the members do not all have the same function. There's a lot of us. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. This is the same analogy he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it illustrates that when the body works properly together, it's great. When the body decides that one part is gonna separate itself, that's a problem. When the eye says, I have no need of you, well, that's just dumb because the eye can't walk on its own. It doesn't have feet. Or in my case, when the leg doesn't work properly because you've had knee surgery, then all of the rest of the body has to accommodate for it. So I'm up here on crutches and I have sore armpits. Anybody that's had knee surgery testify the fact that the armpits don't like knee surgery? Yes, goodness. It's, and gosh, I feel sorry for some of you having to haul back and forth on campus like this, just torturous. I gotta, yeah, I pray for you. And I'm just saying, it's, if the knee's not working right, I got a problem. And every part of my body then has to compensate for that problem. If the body doesn't function like it's supposed to, we've got a problem. And here's the problem. I don't think you realize how important it is that you're a member of a local church right now. Because you, Cedarville's not gonna last you the rest of your life. And if you're not gonna be a member of a local church right now, how do you think you're gonna all of a sudden flip the switch at graduation day and think, oh, the local church is so important? The local church is either important or it's not important. I'm either gonna be a producer in the local church or I'm gonna be a consumer. And if I'm a consumer, I can go online or I can go to a podcast. I can fill up my spiritual cup and I can do absolutely nothing. But the problem is I can't use my spiritual gifts unless I'm plugged into a local body. And if I'm not plugged into that body, I'm not abiding by what Paul is saying here. I'll come back to it again. Plugged into the church and it's gonna tell us to use those gifts because the church is not meant to serve you. You are meant to serve the church. Here we go. One body. And verse, well, verse six. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. So they are given to us by God and they are grace gifts. The words even cares in some of the charismata and some of the gifts. Let us use them. God doesn't care how much you know about your spiritual gifts or how many tests you've taken about them if you're never using them. And if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, just go do something. You'll figure it out. Just be active. Be plugged in. Start in the kids' ministry because there's always a need in the kids' ministry. I go to a local church and I can't get plugged in. Well, what do you want to do? I want to teach, but we have eight Bible faculty members in our church and I can't teach. Go teach kids, especially if you're an aspiring preacher. If you want to be an aspiring preacher, you go teach first and second grade kids and if you can get them to pay attention, anybody will pay attention. <laughs> I'm just saying. They're... Children's ministry, you can come, come down to grace. We need some children's ministry people right now. Come on. 
Come on, do it. And you say, are you doing it? Yes, I do. I work with first and second graders. I'm Thomas the Train. Choo-choo, baby. Let's go. All right. Come see us. Having gifts that differ, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to your faith. I'm not going to go through all these gifts mean because I don't have time. If in service and our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity. Are you going to be a giver one day? Is that what you do? We do it generously. Don't do it grudgingly. If you're doing it grudgingly, that's not your spiritual gift. If you're going to be a gifted as a giver, you're excited about being able to give and to help other people. You do it with enthusiasm. The one who leads with zeal. That word zeal, that means not lazy. You wanna be a leader? If you're gonna be a leader, you may not have anybody over you, so then you can tend to be lazy. If you wanna be a leader, lead with zeal. Lead with passion. Be busy about doing the work because the higher up you go, the less people you have supervising you and the easier it is for you to be lazy and not do your job. And that affects everybody else that serves with you. So if you wanna be a leader, be diligent in the small things. Seek to serve. Do all the little things right. Let's go be passionate about it. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You work with the sick or with the needy. You don't do so with a sad face. You do so with a joyful face and you're bringing happiness to them and you're encouraging them. And sometimes happiness is caught as much as anything else. And when you come in with enthusiasm, it's great. Let love be genuine. This actually doesn't even have a verb in the original language. It's basically just genuine love. So it could be a heading, but here... All of the translations basically provide the verb so it reads better. Let love be genuine. What does that mean? Abhor what is evil. Evil destroys our friends. We don't like it, but we hold fast to what is good because we know that's better for them. We love one another. Several one another sections here. We heard one another sections earlier this week. Love one another with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection. That's Philadelphia. So every time you see the Philadelphia Eagles play and you think about them, it's brotherly affection. So how am I loving my brothers and my sisters in Christ? Well, how do you love your siblings? How many of you have siblings? Shout out. How many of you have siblings? Okay. There's only a small minority that doesn't have siblings. How many of you love your siblings? Okay, that was risky. I wasn't sure that was going to turn out. When you love your siblings, do you love them unconditionally or conditionally? You love them unconditionally because let's face it, they're horrible. You're selfish. You only want your own stuff. I don't care. That's my brother. I, my brother, I could hate my brother one moment, but if somebody picked on my brother, you better get out of the way because I'm about to take them out. I mean, it's don't mess with the brothers. All right. I mean, that's, we're supposed to have that type love too, too many times. We are too quick to have a friend do something to us and then we're done with them. Write them off, cancel them out, I'm going to unfollow them on everything. I'm going to mute them. I'm going to block them. I'm going to make sure I never see them again. I'm going to walk a different way to class and sit in a different section of chapel and change where I eat because I'm done with them. That's not brotherly love. That's also not the grace of the gospel. And I promise you, you have probably done something equally as bad to somebody else and hope they would forgive you rather than counsel you. I'm just saying, genuine love, brotherly love. Hold fast to what's good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Gosh, we don't do this. Give me the praise. I want the praise. Talk about how good I am. Outdo one another in what? Showing honor to others. Do you think strategically about how you can show honor to others? Gosh, we're horrible at this. We gotta get better. Do not be slothful in zeal. I don't even know what that means. Slothful in zeal. I don't know how you put those two together, but it basically means don't be lazy, be passionate. It comes with the right, the next one after it, be fervent in spirit. I love this idiom because this idiom basically means having a boiling spirit within you. If you're not passionate about your faith, you got a problem. Oh, I believe in Jesus. He changed my life. Don't you want him to change your life too? Come on, what's... Be passionate. If you, if you genuinely have a changed life, don't be ashamed of it. Be passionate about it. Be fervent. Have zeal. Fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. This is the one I couldn't figure out. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. We'll come to it. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Oh, this is hard. This is three times back to back, which means we have a problem with it, which means we don't do this well. 
and I think it probably is all of us that don't do this well. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless mentioned twice there, that's once. We're gonna get it again in verse 17. I'll point it out. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. We don't do good at that either. I'll come back to it. Live in harmony with one another. There's our, there's our roommate verse for the year right there. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, humble again, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. That's humility again. Here we're back to repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Here a third time, beloved, never avenge yourself. And then he goes on a moment. But leave it. Leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. How are you not to be conformed to this world? If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you'll heap coals on his head. Now, we don't do this because we're looking to heap coals on his head. We do this because we're wanting him to feel convicted and understand the love of the gospel so that they will then turn to Christ. But more frequently than not, we don't really want them to turn to Christ because they're our enemy and we don't like them. And that's what the world would say. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right, let's walk through all of these different things. So we start with number one. Let me get to it, humility. All right, here's your eight marks. There's your list again. You got them in your mind? So we begin with humility. Here's what humility looks like. Verse three, for by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Someone said it this way. Think of yourself less. It's not that I think lowly of myself so that I never use my gifts it's just that I think of myself less. I'm not so self-centered that I'm thinking of others. This is Philippians 2. This is the mind which is in Christ. Look out not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. This is what we're supposed to do. Another verse in this section that talks about this is live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Do not be prideful. The opposite of that is to have humility, but associate with the lowly. Oh, here we have a problem. How many of you have ever said, in your mind, if not out loud, but probably out loud too, I don't want that person to go. They're not good enough for us. I don't want that person to be invited because you know they have a problem. I don't wanna hang out with that person because they're not as blank as I am. You ever been there? You ever been on the other end of that? Where all of a sudden then you feel really hurt because the friends that you thought you had all of a sudden decided that they were better than you? Friends, it's not Christian maturity when we look at somebody else created in the image of God for whom Christ died and loves just as much as he loves me and me to look at them and say, you're not as good as I am. You can't do that and be a mature follower of Christ. Is it our sinful nature to do that, to exalt ourselves and push others down to do it? But it's not godly. It's not Christian maturity. Don't worry, this text will offend anybody in the room that's not offended already by the time we finish it. Proverbs 3, 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Oh gosh, we're smart around here. We have intelligence, we have IQ, we make good grades on ACTs and SATs and and, and we give away mugs for 4.0s because we're that smart and we like to do that. But brothers and sisters, if we are ever wise in our own eyes, we have a problem because that's pride. God has given us gifts. We should use them and be good stewards of them, but we should recognize that we should never be wise in our own eyes. Romans 1.22, professing to be wise, they became fools. It's that downward spiral we have already covered. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Church membership. A mature mark of a mature Christian is that they're part of the body. For in the body we have many members. The members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. I've already mentioned be producers and not consumers. I've already mentioned that you serve the church. The church is not there to serve you. That is a fundamental shift. There are many churches out there where our mindset is we're going to church on Sunday morning to fill my spiritual cup 
and you fill my spiritual cup and then I take it away and I survive on it all week and then I come back the next Sunday to get my spiritual cup filled. That's not what's being talked about here with the use of your spiritual gifts. It's that I go to this body and I use my gifts as a faithful steward to love other people well so that then as I'm using my gifts, I experience greater joy using my gifts than going for other people to pour into me. Pouring into others has its own incredible reward and I don't want you to miss it. And I found this quote from Douglas Moo just to be striking as I was reading through the commentaries. Here's what he says, quote, we must seriously question then whether Paul would ever even entertain the idea that a person could be a member of the universal church, meaning saved, without being a member of a local church, end quote. Yeah, but I'm a college student, and I know. So I'm just gonna visit a different church every week until I graduate. And you're never gonna get plugged in and you're never gonna serve and you're never gonna build relationships. And then you're gonna go out and you're gonna go to a local church and they're gonna say, what'd you do while you were in college? I just visited around to a bunch of other churches. Oh, but you wanna serve or lead or be employed now? The reason we have the fair that we have at the beginning of the fall semester, so you get to experience all the churches at one time and you can just pick one. Let me tell you, there's no perfect church out there. If you find the perfect church, take a picture and walk away slowly. Because if you join it, it's not gonna be the perfect church anymore. So just just walk away. (laughs) Find a church that you can tolerate and get involved in making it better. Just get plugged in. You won't regret it. All right, I'll quit meddling. Cease to serve. You don't just do what you're told. Go take out the trash. Okay, I'll go take out the trash. Love the dishwasher. Okay. You get it. Somebody tells you to do something. I can't believe my RA told me I have to do this again. I can't believe I'm supposed to do this. Mom and dad called. Oh my goodness. I don't have time for this. Instead, you're seeking. Oh, there's something that needs to be picked up. Oh, I love. I don't think he's here, so I'm gonna talk about him. He'll get mad at me. It'll be okay. He'll forgive me because he has genuine love. I love General Reno. Many of you do too. You see... He was a three-star general in the Air Force. You see him walking around campus and there's a stray piece of trash. I mean, if there's a stray piece of trash being blown by the wind so that you have to chase it down, he's after it. That trash has no chance. It's gonna be dominated in the name of Jesus because he is gonna get that trash and make sure that trash finds a place in the proper trash can. Now, if a three-star general retired from military service who loves the Lord can chase a piece of trash down because he's seeking to be a servant of Christ, So can I, and so can you. Seek to serve. Having gifts that differ, use them. This is easy. I don't know what my gift is. Go to the church and say, where do you need help? And get plugged in and find out. You'll realize real quickly if it's not your gift. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Service. Seek to show hospitality. So then we focus on hospitality, but it says seek to show. And my wife's great at this. I'm horrible at this. I'm an introvert. I would be just fine living with my books in my office alone for the rest of my life. As long as she was there. (laughs) Because she gets me. But she would have people at the house endlessly. And you know what? My life has been much better and much richer because I have a wife who loves to demonstrate love to others and hospitality. And I have so many more friends because of the gift God has given her that she uses so well. And so I say to you guy introverts, look for that girl extrovert that loves you and loves other people well. Not when you're a freshman, by the way, but after you're a freshman. (laughs) And ask them them to the musical event tonight at eight o'clock, is it eight o'clock or seven o'clock? Right here in the chapel. You can get tickets at the door. There you go, there's your date. That was on Cedar Classifieds, I stole that. All right, we're just moving on. Repay no one evil for good, but give thought to, gosh, this is hard. What is honorable in the sight of all? You mean I'm not supposed to just be lazy in my thinking, but I'm actually supposed to give thought to how I can do good things? That's seeking to serve. That's maturity. Genuine love for others. I gotta keep going. Genuine love for others. Let love be genuine or genuine love. I've already told you the verb's not there. That means we abhor what is evil because it destroys people. We hold fast to what is good. We love one another with that brotherly affection and we outdo one another in showing honors to other. Oh, this is, this is it. And we bless those who persecute us. If we genuinely love all people, when somebody persecutes us, we bless them. We don't curse them. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. This is hard. This is hard. 
Okay, how many of you in the room are Ohio State fans? How many of you in the room, when you hear something bad about Michigan as an Ohio State fan, you rejoice in your heart? That's what this verse is saying don't do. I'm just saying. (laughs) Michigan fans? How many of you rejoice when you hear something bad about Ohio State? You know what? I'm, I'm a Tar Heel fan. Duke University can lose and it means absolutely nothing for North Carolina. And I smile and rejoice as soon as I hear it. Because I don't like devils. And Duke's the blue devil. So I don't know how Christians pull for the devil, but that's another story for another time. And so God painted the sky Carolina blue. So as, as, as I pull for my Tar Heels to win the, the tournament, every other team that loses, it's one less opponent. Here's where it gets real. Your friend gets a date, or boyfriend, or girlfriend, or an internship, or an A, oh, here's where it gets really real. Your friend that's in the same class with you that you compete with all the time makes a 98 and you made a 95 and it ruins your day. I can't believe I missed that question. How did I miss the question? What did you make on the test? None of your business. Because I can't rejoice with the friend who made a 98 because I'm so ticked off that I made a 95. Really? You made a 95, be happy. And how many times does it happen that we hear some bad news about somebody else and we're so good at this, we gossip about it in the local church all the time because we say, oh, I have a prayer request. Did you see that so-and-so was going through such and such and we're telling stuff we shouldn't say? Or if you're from the South like I am, you just add bless your heart to anything. You can say the worst thing about anybody you possibly could and then you say bless his heart and it's supposed to make it okay. When we hear bad stuff about other people, why do we rejoice in our hearts? I'm glad I'm not like them. I'm glad that didn't happen to me. I'm glad I'm better than that person. This is hard. Genuine love for one another. It says to us that we are supposed to match the emotions of the other person. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. Anybody ever play dominoes? Anybody ever take the dominoes? You have to match up the right number and you match the number up and you can only match the numbers the only way you can play it. And the goal of playing dominoes to match the number is to get rid of all the dominoes. You win the game when you have spent all your dominoes. This is genuine love in the Christian life. You win the game when you have matched the emotions of your friends in such a way that you have spent all of your emotions in a way that genuinely loves others because you have rejoiced with those who are rejoicing and you have wept with those who are weeping. This is what we're after here. Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 44. I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Friends, this is basic social awareness. You walk in a room and somebody's crying tears and you've got good news, zip it up. What's wrong, man? How can I pray for you? How can I love you? I'm not gonna tell you my great news when I find out that you just found out some really bad news. This is general social awareness that we have to grow mature in how we do. Paul says, I become all things to all people so that by all means I may win some. That's our goal. Generous. Oh, we keep moving here. Generous with resources, time, and possessions. Where does it say this? The one who contributes with generosity, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. You're using your resources if you're gonna be hospitable and you're using your time to host others. This will prevent selfishness, greed, idolizing, isolation, and it encourages the mentality of stewardship. You're supposed to show hospitality to those you know and those you don't. All right, this is one I just couldn't figure out. Pleasant, joyful, patient, steadfast. Here's your verse. Rejoice in hope. Well, that's pleasant. Be patient in tribulation. Patience. I like that word. That's that's pleasant. If you automatically spiral out of control every time something happens, well, then that's, gosh. My wife used to be a part of a group called No Drama Mamas. I don't know if she still is or not, but I thought that was really funny. No Drama Mamas. And the whole point of the group was cut out the drama. Like things can be, you, you get on the roller coaster of life and you hang out with those people that are so high one minute and then are so low the next minute and you're like, time out. I gotta buckle up. I do not, I'm not properly equipped for this ride at the current moment. And I'm just saying to you, what I see in this verse is we're gonna rejoice in hope always. We're gonna be patient in tribulation, but we're gonna be constant in prayer. We're gonna be peaceable. We're gonna be joyful. We're gonna be patient. We're gonna be steadfast. That's what we're supposed to do. Peaceable. Live in harmony with one another. This is easier said than done. You're like, oh yeah, okay, I got that. Yeah, no big deal. Until your roommate does something stupid. 
And then you're like, how could you be so stupid? What's wrong with you? Were you raised in a barn? Did your mom and dad not treat you properly? What's your problem? And we look at them like we've never done something just as bad in our lives. That's not genuine love. And that's not being peaceable. Gosh, you want to be counter-cultural? If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. This should be the theme verse for Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it now. Or all social media. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Learn to control your temper. If every time something happens, you react and they react and you react and it escalates and it goes big. And every time something happens, you just, you just fly off the handle. You're not ready for a serious relationship at that point. If, you're, if you can't control your temper, you're not ready to be a good husband. You're not ready to be a good father. You're not ready to be a good friend. Learn to be peaceable, control your temper, live with others. You say, I am tired of getting my shoes, my feet stepped on here. I'm, this is discipleship. This is sanctification. This is what we all have to strive for. We can only do it with the power of the Spirit. Here's another one. Gosh, I'm horrible at this one. Be quick to apologize. Oh, I did something really stupid. I offended my roommate, and my roommate just let me know about it. And instead of apologizing and saying, yep, you're right, I blew it, I'm gonna give you 18 reasons why what I did was proper. And I'm gonna give you 14 reasons why you're the one that's really to blame here. And if you're smart, and if you like speech and debate, you are probably the worst at this because you can reason, you're probably gonna be a lawyer when you graduate, but you can reason and argue your way out of everything instead of just saying, I'm sorry. Here's another thought I had. If you ever encounter the person or the roommate who looks at you when you've confronted them and they say, I'm sorry, learn how to accept an apology. Yeah, okay, I get your sorry this time, but what about the time when you did such and such and, and, and oh, there's list number 14 of 18 more things that you did wrong and, I'm not apologizing to you ever again. If I apologize to you and all you do rather than say, hey, thanks for apologizing, is you give me a list of other wrongs and you start coming back at me, then what's the good in apologizing to you? And so as mature believers, apologize quickly. As mature believers, accept the apology. How, man, that's really kind of you to apologize. Can we pray about this? Can we hug it out? Can we dap it up? Can we do whatever we're gonna do? Peaceable. All right, I gotta say this. I'm, I'm about done. Very little in life is as big a deal as you think it is right now. There might be something. But a lot of times what I hear, and you're like, this is huge. <laughs> it's not. It's really not that big a deal. You will not believe what so-and-so did to me. Yeah, I will. They're a sinner just like you. I've been at this for 11 years. There's very few things that happen on this campus I haven't heard happen on this campus before. But this is a big deal. No, it's not. This is huge. Will the resurrection fix it? Yeah, not a big deal. It'll be all right. All right, lastly, overcomers. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You cannot overcome sin with sin. You cannot overcome darkness with darkness. You have to overcome the darkness with light. And the word for overcomer here just happens to be Nikeo. And we're watching the NCAA basketball tournament with Nike all over all of those shoes. And I'm not saying Nike and the company. I'm making no comment about them. I'm just saying this can help you remember every time you see the swoosh that you're to be an overcomer because you're in Christ. And Romans 8 tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God. Here's your list one more time. Humility. Check. For today. Check it again tomorrow. Church membership. All right, you can knock that one off the list. I'm plugged into my local church. I'm seeking to serve today. What about tomorrow? Genuine love for others. Hey, you're never gonna get there, but you can try. Pleasant, joyful, patient, steadfast. If you walk around with a sour look on your face all the time, it's no wonder nobody wants to be friends with you. If you are always bringing everybody down, I don't wanna hang out with you either. I have to because I have to show genuine love, but... Be pleasant, be generous, be peaceable, be an overcomer. Final thoughts, because I need to make sure I get this in. This is the mind of Christ. This is Philippians 2. Have this mind, which was in Christ Jesus. Think about this list. 
This is Jesus. He humbled himself. He became one of us. He was obedient. He was seeking how he could serve us. He was generous by giving his life for us. He was hospitable. He was peaceable. He was pleasant to be around. This is Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Okay, there's your list. Start, go to work every day. Go to work. You can't do this without the power of the Spirit in your life. It's not possible. So stay in the Word. Rely on the power of the Spirit. When you mess up, ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Spirit to help you. Ask your friends to forgive you. And keep trudging forward. Oftentimes, we take matters in our own hands because we don't trust God. So I want to say to you, God is faithful. You can trust him. He will take vengeance. He is faithful. He knows all things. He sees all things. He will do what's right in his own time. And if you trust God, you can rejoice with somebody else's good news. You can weep with somebody else's bad news because you know God has a plan for your life too. And you're just gonna trust that that plan is a good plan. And we're all gonna fail, probably today. So keep stumbling forward. Don't fall down the mountain. Keep stumbling as you climb that mountain and keep stumbling forward. Or to say it another way, You're taking a long, slow walk in one direction. So keep walking in that direction. Or, as a longtime servant here at Cedarville used to say, stay the course. You got your compass out. You know where it's pointing you. It's pointing you to Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Stay the course. You're going to mess up. You're going to veer off. Time out. Stay the course. I got to get back on track. Stay the course. If you do these things, you'll have a transformed life. And that transformed life when it's lived out properly, will result in authentic Christian community corporately. And it'll also result in the marks of a mature Christian personally. You are loved. You're loved by us, but you're loved even more by God. So pursue him with a radical pursuit. Dear Lord, we pray that you would help us to be good friends, to love you and to love others well, and to glorify your name with our lives as a faithful steward. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you are dismissed.